Welcome back to the show. Well, today we're giving an update on medical assistance in dying in Canada and the push to expand it even more with my guests, Nicole Scheidel of Canadian Physicians for Life and Angelina Ireland of the Delta Hospice Society. In 2016, the Liberal government of Canada flung wide the doors of medical assistance in dying in our nation, swiftly edging Canada into having some of the loosest laws in the world on the procedure. Initially, medical assistance in dying, often referred to as MAID, was only available for Canadians suffering of serious and incurable physical illnesses with a high likelihood of dying in the foreseeable future. In 2017, 2,838 Canadians died by made that number rose to 4478 in 2018 to 5425 in 2019 and then had a large leap to 7383 in 2020 this accounted for 2.4 percent of deaths in Canada that year the next year in 2021 those who are legally eligible for made was broadened by the Liberal government to include those who are not terminal but have been diagnosed with irremediable, incurable, and intolerable suffering. MAID is now also available for those with disabilities, and there is a push to expand it to youth with disabilities as well. In mid-June, a special joint committee of the House of Commons and the Senate released an interim report studying the law and its impacts. This report was actually a requirement of the law that was passed in 2021. The report gave support for the 2021 expansion for eligibility and said safeguards are sufficient so long as they are interpreted correctly. Well, this was the issue that was precisely the one flagged by witnesses who said that there is no official scientific definition for irremediable, incurable, and intolerable suffering. And therefore, so many of the lines are subjective and blurry. Mental health experts are also warning that the current law leaves those who are depressed and suicidal vulnerable to making an irreversible decision that they may have changed their mind on if given just a little more time and proper emotional counseling. This is a very challenging uh, conversation and a very complicated dynamic that has now impacted tens of thousands of Canadians and their loved ones. Well, joining me today to give an update on what they are seeing on the front lines of this issue is Angelina Ireland, president of the Delta Hospice Society, a nonprofit dedicated to providing palliative care. They came under intense pressure from the BC government to provide MAID in their facility. They pushed back and have now secured their status as a pro-life nonprofit palliative care organization. Nicole Scheidel, the executive director of Canadian Physicians for Life, is also joining me. That's a registered charity which exists to support medical students and doctors in their delivery of medicine in the Hippocratic tradition to do no harm. Both of them have profound insight and frontline experience on how this legislation has been impacting Canadians. Thank you for joining me today for this very important and emotional conversation. So without any further delay, let's get to it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, ladies. It's such an honor to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having thank me, you. Katie. Amazing. Well, Nicole, let's start with you. Uh, your organization, um, you know, helps serve the medical community, but you've been watching this issue so closely right since the beginning. I remember chatting with you back in 2014, 2015. For the, our viewers that are watching right now, can you give a bit of an update on what's been happening in the nation and, and kind of where we're at right now? Sure. So when Bill C-7 came about last year, that removed the reasonably foreseeable requirement for receiving MAID. So you didn't have to be dying in order to have your life ended with MAID. And what happened after that was the um, government passed that bill. It also had a sunset clause on mental illness so that people who were depressed had a mental illness could also uh, be euthanized. And so that will come into effect in March 2023. So as part of that effort, the government has an expert committee that they've struck to study what guidelines should be put in place with that. I can tell you that two of the members who were part of that committee have resigned from the committee because they felt it wasn't taking a uh, even-handed approach to this issue. And also the government as well had struck a committee to review 
the made regime in Canada up till this date. They were having meetings in uh, the early part of the year. They cancelled their last set of meetings and did not hear from a disability panel that was scheduled to come in front of them. And they've issued an interim report. Oh, wow. So and and if there was ever a panel that they probably should be listening to, it would be a disabilities panel for sure. Um, now, I remember when it was first passed in 2016, our medical assistance in dying was uh, legalized. So much concern about the the apparent lack of protections, the lack of checks and balances, the possible vulnerability of people being in a situation where, where they might feel coerced into uh, taking a medical assistance and dying path because of lack of services or feeling like they're a burden to their family. Do you feel, Nicole, like the, the, that um, concern has been resolved in any way by this Liberal government, or do you feel like it's just kind of gotten looser and more precarious in terms of the checks and balances? It's absolutely gotten more precarious because the checks and balances that were there are now no longer there. There's no waiting periods. Uh, the 10-day waiting period was removed. You know, there's not a lot of support. We see what's happened in our healthcare system with waiting lists expanding. We've seen the mental health issues go through the roof because of the pandemic. We've seen uh, people living in poverty, particularly disabled groups who don't have enough support. And now we're seeing stories of them being green lit for uh, made because they uh, their lives are intolerable. So instead of trying to solve the problems of their suffering, we're actually just eliminating the sufferer. And it feels like such a contradiction. I remember it was probably about a decade ago now where I believe it was Harold Albrecht, a conservative member of parliament, was pushing so hard for a national suicide prevention plan, you know, and we had all of the stories that were happening about the, the suicide pan, um, epidemic in our First Nations communities. And there was such a strong push at that time to find ways to help people through the dark seasons of their life. But what you're saying now is that since that 10-day waiting period is gone, someone who's suicidal, depressed, could conceivably, especially if they have another physical condition, um, you know, request medical assistance in dying and be dead within 48 hours. Is that conceivable? Is this the type of thing that's happening, Nicole? I mean, yes, certainly you can um, be assessed for MAID and receive MAID all in a day, right? Like really, it can happen that quickly. I know there's a story that came out of BC where a family took their um, brother to the emergency room because he was depressed and suicidal and they were concerned about him and he ended up receiving MAID. So they were so distraught because they thought they were taking their brother to the hospital to get help and instead he was euthanized. The problem is, is that standards of care or usual treatment options are not being followed and so that is a problem. Then also, who do you how do you decide who gets suicide prevention and who gets suicide assistance? If like a doctor is a kind of in a situation in society where they have, uh, they're well educated, they have uh, uh, resources, they're not in the same situation as someone who might be struggling, and it's easier to make a judgment on their lives and whether their life is worth living or not. And so the individuals who are most vulnerable, who are most at, most at risk, are the ones who will um, not get the good care. For physicians too, it's something, it's hard, right? Like you have to um, learn how to check your own preconceived notions at the door for somebody else's life. And especially if you don't know them well, if you haven't been treating them for a long period of time and you see them in a moment, you can jump to conclusions that are not necessarily fair or accurate. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Intense. Um, Angelina, thank you for holding on there. So you are have become a legend uh, in our nation on this topic. Uh, the You're leading now the, the Delta Hospice Society, been through such a battle, lost two facilities eight, worth $8.5 million because your organization took a stance to say, hey, we are not going to allow medical assistance in dying within our facility. We facilities, excuse me, and we want this to be a safe space for people who have a pro-life bent in life. Um, where are you guys at right now, Angelina? And then we'll talk about um, what you're observing. But but give us a quick update on what's happening with the mm -hmm. Hospice Society. You know, they we were apparently such a threat that they tried to destroy our organization completely. So our first battle was to protect our organization so that we could continue to have a voice in this country about this issue. Um, and we have been successful 
in that. Therefore, we have been successful to be able to continue to speak on a national platform about what's happening in this country. And it was so amazing to see the rise. Like, uh, you know, there were people from all over Canada that signed up to be a part of your hospice society, even though it's BC based, because so many people perceived like, listen, this is a watershed moment, moment that if you're not able to stand your ground to say, hey, we want to be a pro-life palliative care nonprofit organization. If you lose that battle, it could affect people all across Canada. It could be precedent setting. So it was amazing to see people across Canada really rise into that moment. So what are you hearing? What are you seeing on the ground in terms of the real human impacts on Canadians, Canadian families, uh, because of how the legislation has progressed? Yeah, you know, there is a battle going on for the hearts and the minds of Canadians right now. The minds in terms of, uh, you know, palliative care, right? Palliative care is a very clear uh, discipline. We have 50 years um, of history that says right from its inception that we do nothing to hasten death. But now, you know, we see this coercive makeover a uh, hostile takeover of palliative care by this almost invasive species, which says that of course you can't, of course you can kill people in palliative care, right? And, and very few voices that are able to be heard about what palliative care truly is. And second of all, you know, for the hearts, for the hearts of Canadians in terms of um, this uh, campaign, um, I would even go as far as to say this propaganda about, you know, the only good death is a euthanized death where national lobby groups, national activists with lots and lots of money and lots of power behind them, trying to create what I would consider to be a narrative, almost a fairy tale of, you know, this perfect poster family where everybody got together and decided and in agreement of supporting mom and dad, and they're going to be taking made when the time comes, when in reality, that is not the experience of many, if not most Canadians right now. You know, the experience is that people are um, suffering, they're having inadequate health care, inadequate support, um, they are, like many times, poor, uh, disabled, that are having, you know, made suggested to them. And they're taking this because they have no other options. That's the reality of what's happening. So the Delta Hospice Society has walked in to this situation trying to provide concrete um, uh, strategies, concrete tools that people can use to protect themselves in what looks to me um, like a war zone, honestly. Wow, amazing. And so you're literally in a rebuilding phase right now. You're offering services, support, but you, you're also fundraising, I guess, to get, get a new building, I would, I would presume. Is that a good assumption? Well, you know, ultimately, you know, we want to provide a sanctuary. I mean, from the moment that MAID was allowed with Bill C-14 and then it's, you know, disaster of Bill C-7, uh, we have always been fighting for authentic palliative care. We try to protect our hospice as a sanctuary for the dying, and the government took it from us because we refused to kill our patients. We now walk into um, an environment where we want to provide a sanctuary, a sanctuary for people who don't want to be caught up in a system. That's literally telling them um, that, you know, the only good death is a euthanized death and, oh, it's human rights and, you know, it's, it's <laughs> human rights to kill yourself. I mean, all this kind of nonsense. So, yes, you know, we are um, trying to lay a foundation for others to follow um, and to provide sanctuaries across this country. We love Canada and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today.
So let's go back to the service availability issue, because I remember, again, at the beginning of this whole conversation a few years back, um, you know, the statistic was being floated that only that 30, I think it was thir only 30 percent of Canadians actually have access to quality palliative care. And so it was creating a massive vulnerability gap, uh, you know, with, if there's somebody that needs palli palliative care, can't get it maybe they they will go for medical assistance and die and just simply because they don't have those services. Now, now we have more than more than doubled the debt here uh, in the last 2 years. I must I I hope some of that is landing in the palliative de care department, development department of our of our various provinces. Um, Nicole, are you seeing access to palliative care increasing across the nation or decreasing? Uh, can you speak to that for a moment? Sure. I think I would say it's absolutely decreasing. Funds that are being funneled into palliative care are being used up by the MATE teams. So that's being, uh, it's disrupting palliative care funding. The other thing that's happening is many physicians who were palliative care physicians have left the practice because they do not want to be forced into supporting uh, MADE. There was an article in the Toronto Sun uh, just published a day or two ago by Dr. Mark D'Souza, who said, I left palliative care because I did not want to kill my patients. And so you're seeing a reduction in the number of physicians and nurses who are willing to work in that area because of the pressure being put on them to uh, be part of the euthanization of their patients. And that no doubt will affect the culture of medicine uh, across Canada, um, that's a pretty easy read. And so, Nicole, um, let's, you talk about the 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 sort of sense of coercion that some doctors and nurses are maybe feeling to uh, participate in something that they feel uncomfortable with uh, from a conscience level. I know Kelly Block, member of Parliament, uh, Kelly Block actually tabled a private members bill uh, for physician conscience rights. Um, any movement legislatively that you're seeing, um, you know, even at the provincial level in terms of physician conscience protection? The problem with physician conscience um, legislation is that it gets all tied up in other red herring issues. And so it get, tends to get derailed pretty quickly. I think it's an important thing to have physicians be able to practice with integrity and following their deeply held moral convictions. And so I'm hoping that we'll get there eventually. I know the World Medical Association is very strong on the protection of physician conscience rights and that phys physicians should be able to practice conscientiously. But in this country, it's, it's a problem. I mean, Manitoba has legislation protecting physician conscience rights around euthanasia. Nowhere else does that occur in Canada. Um, though when the criminal code was revised to allow um, euthanasia instead of not being a homicide, so it took it out of the criminal code it, or made a exemption for it. It also said that no one would be forced to participate, but yet we see the um, colleges and the medical system kind of walking past that and forcing doctors to participate, if not through actually performing the um, euthanasia, through referrals, through other ways of supporting that kind of um, provision of services. Now, I want to talk um, tools for families here for a moment. So let's say that you have someone in your family that you love. You know that they're in a vulnerable category. Like when I hear you say, Nicole, that someone can request assisted suicide and be gone in the same day, like that gives no room for a family member to step into the situation and say, hey, you know, mom, dad, and uncle, why don't you just come over for the weekend? We'll love on you. We'll talk, we'll talk you through this. Like it really gives no window for family and loved one intervention into the process from what I understand. And so how would you advise people in light of this dynamic? Do you have any tools or tips that you are giving to Canadians? Um, either one of you can, can speak to this one. We have gone, we've gone to a lawyer and we have developed what we call a DNE, a do not euthanize advanced directive for every province in this country. And what that does, just like the DNR, do not, do not resuscitate, do not help me if I'm dying. This is the opposite of that. This is do everything you can to ensure that you give me the best chance at living. The DNE can be ordered uh, free of charge by our members on deltahospicesociety.org. Um, membership is $10. 
Come on, we'll give, give it to you for whatever province that you live in. Take it, witness it, have it among your papers. We will also provide a wallet sized card that says, do not euthanize. I have signed an advanced directive. So investigate that before uh, suggesting um, made to me. And basically what this is, this is like our line in the sand. And we are saying that um, our people uh, will not be bullied or harassed to death, literally, in their most vulnerable moments. And you know, and these these this special papers can be kept among all the most valuable things that you have. And this is one way, at least, to protect our loved ones when we can't be there with them 24-7, right? And you know, they can have this with them um, so that people in uh, long-term care facilities, hospitals, emergency rooms say, oh, we better treat this person a little differently than we've been treating the rest of the people. And so obviously that would have to be signed off on by the individual. And so there would have to be a uh, consent uh, of the individual on that. Um, and any would, other... Any other tips that you're giving to family members? So if you if you see somebody on a trajectory, like are there intervention options that people um, have at all? Well, we also have a helpline. We have a 1-800 helpline, 1-800-232-1589. And we will get you into contact with a counselor, you know, a euthanasia prevention counselor or a bereavement counselor or somebody who's a professional that you can speak to. Not somebody who's going to just affirm your suicidal ideations, right? But somebody who will help to speak with you about why and how and what are the resources that you need, right? What are the, what are the resources that caregivers need? Because ultimately, that is a particularly important foundation in order to help protect people. So caregivers have to be well, and the, the person themselves that's dealing with the illness has to be well. Nicole, um, if somebody wants to email a member of parliament, you know, email an elected official, a senator, um, and express their concern about uh, how this has been progressing, um, what advice do you give them at this point? Well, I think it's really important to email and communicate with your member of parliament or your senator, especially um, sending in a letter that is from your heart, that speaks to the things that concern you and is not necessarily a form letter but something that t tells them that this is on your mind and you're concerned about it. They do listen, they do pay attention, they are monitoring how people are responding to this issue. So I think that it is important to make your voice heard. It does make a difference. Um, I, I have spoken to a number of members of parliament who do pay attention to what their constituents are saying. So it's really important to speak to your MP regardless of what party they're from, because that will have an impact because they do listen to their constituents. You know, as I've been watching the dynamic around this nationally, there are a few stories that actually really hit me personally. One was the lady who couldn't get affordable housing. And so because of that, opted for assisted suicide. And I, I read that story in the news. I thought, you know what, this should never happen. This should never happen in Canada where someone is choosing to end their life because they don't have a place to live because of the homelessness issue. I, another was actually a friend of mine. I hope he goes public soon on this. Um, he's a, a high profile leader whose uh, father uh, fell, broke his hip, um, basically doctor shopped until he found somebody that would would basically affirm that this was a terminal situation that because he was 80 he was going to die soon he actually did find a doctor that um, that basically signed off on that and said yeah you're 80 your hip will probably never heal uh, this man didn't want to be a burden to his elderly wife and so in silence without the opportunity for his family to say goodbye or anything, he ended up taking his life. And here on the other side of that, you see a family um, absolutely devastated because they didn't get an opportunity to walk with and dialogue with their father um, through this. And then, you know, another high profile situation that happened recently, a woman who was healed of breast cancer once, uh, got it a second time, fought ardently, against it and um, ended up dying um, a natural death in the end. But the Instagram post from her daughter, I thought it was so touching. And I want to share this because there might be some of our viewers right now that are maybe wrestling with the medical assistance and dying question. And and the, the quotes or the post from her daughter was, Mom, thank you so much for fighting to give us more time to spend with you. 
that sometimes I think those who are disabled and elderly, they maybe are made to feel like they're a burden. And yet the reality is, is that they're a blessing and families treasure, treasure the time that they get um, so often with their, their elderly parents and, and loved ones. And so these are, this is an ecosystem. This conversation is an ecosystem. And I really hope we get to the point in our nation where we begin to treat it like an ecosystem because family members have been so profoundly impacted by this. So really appreciate this conversation today. Um, just regret that we're almost out of time here. But uh, to both of you, any final words to our viewers on this very important conversation for our nation right now? Angelina, why don't you go first? You know, what we have found out in the last three years fighting this on the front line is that there are many of us. We are an army. Pro-life nation has tremendous power. We can change the policies of this country. Uh, and that's probably the biggest takeaway that I have is that we have tremendous hope um, in, in the times when it feels dark and hopeless. Um, and if we stand together, we can not only change this country, but we can change the world. Nicole, anything you want to add to that? That was powerful. Yeah, so I it, I go back to the last comments you made about being a burden. How as a nation, how as an individual, do we learn tenderness and care and generosity if we're never called on to show it? And one of the beautiful things about people at the end of their lives is they allow us, those who care for them, to actually care for them, both in the medical system, at home. And if we make that situation go away where we don't have the opportunity to care, then we actually deny something very profoundly important to our nation, the ability and opportunity to love. Wow, that is so well put. You know, I have to say some of my most treasured moments with my grandfather who has now uh, passed on were actually in his dying months where I was able just to sit with him and pray with him and and connect and hear stories, you know, and so that's a, that's a very pregnant point. So Wow. Uh, well, we'll obviously continue to watch this and continue to contact our members of parliament and continue to track both of you. So Angelina Ireland with the Delta Hospice Society, Nicole Scheidel with Canadian Physicians for Life. Thank you so much for your investment of time today and for being with me. You're welcome. Thank you, Bay team. Thanks for joining us today. I do hope you appreciated this conversation. I know it was an emotional one, but we do want to say how much we appreciate you, our viewers. You know, our team is constantly sharing with me how encouraged they are when they speak with many of you by phone or by email and hear your gratitude for the information that guests like the ones we brought today are bringing to the nation of Canada and that we're tackling these challenging conversations. So we appreciate this type of feedback and we appreciate our partners that make it possible. If you would like to become a monthly partner or give a special gift today. We would be so grateful. We stay on air because of the generosity of Canadians like you who value these dialogues. So every amount makes a huge difference and every amount is also tax receivable. To help out, simply call 1-866-844-0844 or visit fateteen.tv. At that site, you can also see this episode and other previous episodes if you want to watch it again or share it with your loved ones. Don't forget, we also have that free smartphone app, our weekly podcast on iTunes and our email list if you sign up for any of these, you will be notified whenever there is a new program so that you never miss a show. Thank you again for joining me today. I do appreciate it and I hope to see you next week.